All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our second day of the Protestant Reformation. Today we're going to be looking at other leaders that were a part of the Reformation and the different like denominations of Christianity that they became the heads of. All right, so to begin, we're going to talk about this guy, John Calvin. And from him, we get what is called the Calvinists. Now, these are people who they would agree with Martin Luther and his, a lot of his ideas. Um, but they're going to go a step further and believe in something called predestination. Okay? We'll be talking about that more in just a moment. But these guys, they believed in strong work ethic, uh, moral behavior. They basically wanted us to be the best that we can be, the best versions of ourselves. And, you know, by living a righteous life, living a life for God. Now, predestination. Basically, what it means is that fate, if whether we're going to heaven or to hell, has already been predetermined by God, and there's nothing that we can do about it. That's basically what it is. Now, what they're going to do is they're going to spread into areas in France, the Netherlands, and especially in Scotland. Scotland's going to actually become like a safe haven for Calvinists. And he's really going to be the guy who takes the Protestant Reformation and like makes it go out of Germany. Because basically Germany is where everything is happening. That's where Martin Luther is with all of his people because that's where it all got started. Otherwise, it's just Catholics out there. But now you've got the Calvinists that are roaming around, spreading ideas, and they're gonna cause a bit of mischief in that way. So now we get to talk about this guy, the big guy, King Henry VIII of England. He's always an interesting person to talk about because there's a lot of craziness that goes on with him. Some of you might know a little bit about him already, others of you do not. We're going to get a nice little overview. All right, so when you are a king, doesn't matter what country you're from, your main goal is to make sure that there is a chain of succession for when you die, you know, you have an heir to the throne. And what is the number one desired type of heir? A male heir having a son. Henry wanted a son more than anything in the world. Now, he was married to Catherine of Aragon, a Spanish princess who became his queen, and she was the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella, like the Ferdinand and Isabella, the ones who sent Columbus on his expedition to, well, try and get to India, but wound up finding the Caribbean. All right, now Catherine, is going to give birth to Henry's first child, and that is a girl named Mary. She would later be known as Bloody Mary. Uh, he still wants a boy, obviously. And so after trying for a number of years to try and have more kids with Catherine, it just does not work out. So then he becomes in one of Catherine's ladies-in-waiting, basically like her assistant, her... Uh, just a woman that follows her around and does things for her. This is a woman named Anne Boleyn. And Anne did not make it a secret that she was interested in King Henry. And they wanted to, you know, be a thing. But Catherine's in the way. And divorce is not really an allowed thing in the Catholic Church. So what he needed was an annulment. Basically something that's going to undo the marriage not a divorce, but basically something that's going to say that it is not a legitimate marriage. And the Pope, he would not grant an annulment because basically he was the only one who could grant one. So Henry's just like, well, you know what? If you're not going to give me an annulment, I'm going to give myself an annulment. So this is how the Anglican Church is born. All right. He's basically like, you know what, church, you're not doing what I want so that I can get what I want. So I'm going to do it myself. 
and he's going to confiscate all the church lands. They're going to become a part of the kingdom. So he's going to get a bunch more income because of all those lands that are now being worked like by his people. And he was able to divorce Catherine and he could then marry Anne Boleyn. And Anne is going to then have a baby girl. This is Elizabeth. Uh, the Elizabeth. Elizabeth the first in the year, years to come. We'll be talking about her more shortly. Now, yep, that's going to explain the whole the property thing that I was just talking about. So go ahead and look at that real fast. It's just going to help add even more wealth to Henry and his kingdom. But now, because you know. Anne Boleyn, she's not able to have any more kids. Uh, she has a couple of miscarriages, very, very sad, and it just, they're not able to have more. He basically gets sick of her and is like, you know what? Uh, I'm going to move on to someone else, a lady named Jane Seymour. And, you know, he's going to try and, you know, have a kid with her. But... Yeah, that, it, that one's going to be interesting, too. So what he does to get rid of Anne, he's basically going to have all these falsified charges against her, including treason against the crown, her committing adultery or cheating on him, uh, possibly with her cousin or brother, stuff like that. Basically, really, really bad crimes. And she's you know, found guilty, and she gets her head chopped off. And there is a little story that goes along with that, how basically when she is told that she's going to be executed, Henry basically goes in, you know, it's not going to be with an ax, it's going to be with a sword because only a quick death for you. Yeah, pretty messed up. Uh, and that whole thing is because, you know, axes um, might not go all the way through a neck in one swipe, it might take two or three. If it's, you know, they're, they're more of a blunt chopping type of implement, whereas a sword, clean cut, one swipe, done. So Anne is dead, and the next day he marries Jane Seymour. And she is the one who gives him a son, a boy named Edward. Uh, she's then going to die two weeks later because of complications with giving birth. Henry, of course, is heartbroken over this because, you know, this is the woman, like, he, he loved all of his wives at some point, but this one, this is the woman who gave him a son. So she's going to be, like, the standard of a good woman for Henry, basically for the rest of his life, at least you know, starting out with the rest of his wives to come. So uh, he is then matched up with a woman named Anne of Cleves, so another Anne. Uh, this didn't work out, and yeah, he basically is like, you know what? Never mind. I want to. I want this one instead. And she's like, you know what? I know your reputation, you get rid of women, and so I'll just, I'll just go away somewhere. And then his fifth wife, another woman named Catherine, Catherine Howard, um, he was crazy about this one, but then she wound up having an affair, and she, like this, this one broke him, uh, which he then had her executed as well by beheading. Then we get his sixth wife, another woman named Catherine, and she is able to stick it out just long enough that he's going to die before her. Yeah. It, it, Henry and his wives is just one big crazy mess. It's, you know, you can find countless books and essays and things on it. Uh, I just gave you the very, very quick version, but just know that he was married six times. There were three women named Catherine, two Anne's, and a Jane. Now, 
after Henry VIII, his youngest child, Edward, is going to become king. He becomes Edward VI. And that's, you know, before his sisters, because the right of inheritance for kings and all is from male to male. Now, he becomes king at age nine, but he's not old enough. So we're going to have basically a council, which is Protestant in their church beliefs. And they're going to basically rule in Edward's stead until he turns 18 and can legally take over the the kingship of ruling England. But he is never going to get the opportunity to. He's going to die from tuberculosis, a very bad and deadly disease. Not anymore because now we have antibiotics for it. But back then, it was almost guaranteed to be a death sentence. You know, you're basically, you're spitting up blood and, you know, your your lungs are like basically scarring up and you're just, you basically rot from the inside out, to put it bluntly. So he died very painfully. And then the throne is going to pass to the oldest of the sisters, Mary. But she's going to bring Catholicism back and... <laughs> Don't hear that too much anymore, do you guys? So she, being a Catholic, a very devout Catholic, is going to bring back those belief systems with the church, and she's going to get her nickname Bloody Mary because she would be responsible for the death of, uh, I'm trying to remember how many Protestants she had killed. If, If it wasn't the hundreds, it was into the lower thousands. Uh, She had quite a few people killed because of their religious beliefs. Now, about five years into her reign, uh, she is going to die without a child. And her younger sister, Elizabeth, the only surviving child of Henry VIII, is going to become the new queen. All right. So, under Elizabeth I like V. Elizabeth, the one that we think of like that golden age of England. Uh, She was the one that was in charge of England during the time of, you know, the Spanish Armada, for any of you who know what that one is. Um, We'll be talking about that at another point. But Elizabeth I is going to make the Anglican Church, the church that her father established, the National Church of England, well, the British Isles, so the territory that they control in the British Isles, so England, Wales, parts of Scotland, parts of Ireland, all that. Now, even though she wanted, she got England back to their Protestant ways, she would be tolerant of religious differences. That's a very big thing right there, religious tolerance, letting people worship how they want because that's their business. Now, Everyone wanted her to get married, have kids, all of that, but she never did. There, so she would get the nickname the Virgin Queen. Um, don't we can't really say how accurate that nickname is because let's face it, she she had plenty of opportunity to not be. So yeah, they only called her that because she was an unmarried queen. And that is because she wanted to hold on to her power and not get married and then have to give up her power as the only monarch to a man. So score for women's rights and power, right? Now, even though she didn't marry, you know, not a big deal, she would be queen for 44 years. That is a very long time, no matter what country's monarchy we're talking about. Uh, The only one that has beaten that is the current Queen of England, Elizabeth II. Um, She passed it not that long ago and is now like the longest ruling monarch in English history. And during Elizabeth I's reign is when England becomes a very prominent power in Europe. They become one of those superpowers of the Renaissance era. Like if something's happening in Europe, England is involved and they are a big player in whatever is going on. Now, 
The Reformation is going to also bring capitalism into a number of countries, but we're going to be focusing on England primarily right now. Now, Capitalism is basically a economic and political system where countries trade and their industries. So their manufacturing capabilities is controlled by private ownership. So individual people instead of the state, because it, you know, you can have healthy competition that way you get lower prices, maybe better quality, because if it's state controlled, it's just whatever the state wants and you know that's not always best it might just be low quality high priced uh, nobody really wants that all right now let's take a look at what's going on in france so in france a very very catholic nation so the Catholic monarchy is going to do something a little interesting. They're going to grant the French Huguenots, Huguenots are Protestants, freedom of worship. So the ability to just, you know, do their own thing under an edict called the Edict of Nantes. This would later be taken away. And, all right. And they would be persecuted, but, you know, that would be after some time has gone by. Now, Cardinal Richelieu would change the focus of the Thirty Years' War because, you know, all these things that we're talking about are happening during the Thirty Years' War. And France would become a very big player in the fighting during the second and third portions of the war because it's kind of broken into three phases. The first phase is purely on religious boundaries and... Then the second phase, I believe, is the Swedish phase, where Sweden becomes a very, very big and important player. And the third phase is where everything turns more political and economic in people wanting to gain those advantages. That's really where Cardinal Richelieu and France thrived with this. Now, Cardinal Richelieu, if any of you know the Three Musketeers story, uh, he's basically, he's the Cardinal Richelieu of that. Um, he's kind of like a villain, like they always try to play him off as trying to take over the throne, be the puppet master over King Louis. All right. And there's a portrait of him. It's not a very great quality, but let's just say very elaborately dressed, you know, the flowing red robes and all that. The church moving forward during the Reformation era. Um, what do you see going on here? We have a guy who is being hung up by his arms and he's got a stone tied to his ankles. Uh, he's being stretched out and these guys in the hoods, they are not some type of French KKK thing. They are the Inquisition. We'll be getting to talk about them. The KKK would take some inspiration from organizations like the Inquisition because of the robes and the masks and the hoods, all that stuff. But that's the only like similarity between them. Now, the church of course does not like the amount of people that they are losing to the Protestant movement. So they need to start bringing in some reforms and basically reestablish themselves as the religious authority over the Christian world. So some ways that they're going to try and do that. They're going to establish what is called the Society of Jesus. They're also known as the Jesuits. These are people who are basically going to, they're missionaries. They're going to spread the word of the Catholic Church around the world. So a lot of exploration that's going on, like for France, for Spain, for Italy, they have Jesuit priests on their ships to preach to the native populations of the new lands that they explore and they colonize and all of that. Okay. Now, to deal with people challenging their authority, the Inquisition is established to enforce and reinforce Catholic doctrine, the Catholic belief system. 
Um, as you can tell here, there's a dude strapped to this wheel and he's basically being spun around. And sometimes there would be over like hot coals or something like that. Uh, sometimes there would be blades that would cut them as they spin around. Very, very nasty stuff. And this would be like, hey, are you uh, repentant of leaving the church? And if someone said no, uh, they keep getting tortured. And if they say yes, uh, maybe it would just be a quick execution and not a painful one. Very messed up stuff. Now, the papacy, the Pope, there will be some reform going on here. Um, they're going to move away from being a political powerhouse and start to shift back to actually caring about people's souls. And we're going to hold what is called the Council of Trent. This is basically a meeting where they are going to reestablish what the church's beliefs are and what their mission is in the world. Among those things are that people need faith and to do good works to get into heaven. So basically sticking with that thing that Martin Luther did not like. Uh, there are seven sacraments, including confession, that good Christians still need to do. Uh, Martin Luther got, did away with confessions because the, that he believed was only something that should be between the sinner and God. That there should be no in-between because anybody should be able to pray to their God. Uh, priests cannot get married. They live by the example of Jesus. Jesus never got married. So they, it's basically a belief that they uh, stem from that. And now they're also reaffirming the belief in purgatory, which is basically a waiting room because that everyone has to wait in uh, because no one is pure enough in life to go to heaven. So you need your sins paid for by getting an indulgence. And you have to earn that indulgence. They can no longer be bought. So that's actually a pretty good one right there. So you can't just buy a piece of paper and get the get out of hell free card. Uh, you now have to earn it. Okay. So the Reformation is going to divide everything and we're going to have a lot of intolerance going on. That's how we get the 30 years war. You know, Christians killing Christians just because they believe it in things just a little bit different. It's kind of ridiculous, right? So, we already talked about him a little bit, Gutenberg, his, his invention is going to help spread the ideas of the Reformation and the Renaissance, which is how a lot of this stuff starts to happen. And a lot of this is going to trigger a growth in secularism, which is like belief in just the regular worldly things and individualism. So people allowing to be themselves and do what they want for the most part and a growth in religious tolerance. So like, hey, you do your thing, I'll do my thing and we'll leave it at that. That's the way it should be, right? Now, the Reformation, the main beliefs that you really need to keep in mind are secularism is separation of church and state, something that we can have in our constitution in the United States today. Now, individualism, basically how you're allowed to be an individual and not be a part of the hive mind or anything like that, okay? It's like, you can do your own thing, you don't have to conform. And religious tolerance, I think that's pretty easy to explain. You're allowed to practice whatever religious beliefs you want, unless it includes human sacrifice, is basically what it boils down to. Now, we talked a little bit about the 30 Years War. We talked about some of it today, but here's basically the wrap up of it. The fighting took place like 95% in Germany. A third of the German population, of the male German population, was dead. 
that is one out of every three men that was dead. Okay. That is a huge loss. So if you look at that map, the basically like the darker the color gets, uh, the higher the percentage of death rate there was. The red date, uh, the red areas, over 50% of deaths for the, in that area. Now, Prussia, which is an Eastern German province, you know, kingdom, uh, they are going to become the most important and most powerful of the German states. And they're going to be a very big thing that we talk about in the future of this class. France also is going to be the strongest country in continental Europe at this time, because like they fared pretty well during this war. And yeah, they're going to continue to do well for quite some time. Basically into the late 1800s, they're gonna do well. Now, the peace of Westphalia is going to officially end the Thirty Years' War. It's going to leave eight million people dead. Remember, 94% uh, uh, of them are going to be Germans. That is a catastrophic death toll. All because they believed in how to practice Christianity a little bit different from each other. It's not like it was super different. It was a little different. Instead of having all the fancy robes and like decorations everywhere, you know, you just go into a church that's a little more simple in its layout and in its uh, the things that happen during the service. That's it. Eight million people died because of that. All right, that's going to do it for today. Come back next time, and we will continue with our World History 2 information.